the, the, the uh, uranium from Africa was what went into the nuclear bomb in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, and there was a whole set of photographs which I found in a South American uh, a book by a South American photographer of uh, Picasso completely refusing to sell any piece of sculpture to this. Um, and it was just a year after Patrice Lumumba was killed um, in, in, uh, after he'd been elected. And he was elected on the basis that, uh, in a quite a kind of radical base. And so uh, it's assumed that the uh, American mining millionaires, billionaires, were behind the execution of the Patrice Lumumba. So I got fascinated by all of this. But I started thinking more and more. I'm quite kind of lucky, in a sense, because my family were five fishermen. Uh, my grandmother was an Irish, uh, French polisher on the cloud side. My father was a cabinet maker. Uh, uh, my five fishermen grandfather moved down to Kent during the First World War to work on merchant shipping. And uh, uh, he was killed in an accident in 1924. And so my grandmother had to bring up seven children under the age of 11. So I came out of a very poor background. My grandmother had an attic room and they were living in London in the 30s for men going to fight in the Spanish Civil War. And so I had this kind of radicalism uh, around, which uh, means that I'm not frightened of digging into history. And I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I prepared a little text that I'm just back from Dusseldorf this weekend. I went to see the exhibition of Marcel Brodhaus about the Eagle Museum, which is actually about empires and the use of the eagle as a symbol of empires. Assyrian, Egyptian, Roman, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, Napoleon. Napoleon sailed 50,000 troops to Egypt in 1798, and hence the color the very fashionable colour, Odinio, is about that uh, Napoleonic invasion of Egypt, then Hitler, and now the US. The US Embassy in Grosvenor Square, go now before it's been knocked down. Uh, in March 1968, there was an enormous demonstration in, in Grosvenor Square, which is before May 68. And, before the Rome occupation of the university in Rome and then the Venice Biennale was occupied as well. What remains for the artist of a country that wages a war like that in Vietnam, but to make minimal art, you know, no content. Uh, and the, the Rolling Stones were at that march uh, in Grosvenor Square under this great big massive concrete eagle that sits on top of the American embassy. Uh, and the Stones went home that night and wrote Street Fighting Man. So it's a, it doesn't say a lot in the lyrics, but it's the thought that counts. Broadhouse also used palm trees, symbolising the colonial officers who retired back to Ostend, Margate, Scarborough, into the Winter Gardens. In Jesse Conrad's book, Heart of Darkness, published in 1901, the young men go into the great portals of the Royal Belgian Congo Company in Brussels and sign their lives away for service in Africa. There are two elderly women seated either side of the portals of the Belgian Congo Company and they're sitting there silently knitting, making lace as they watch the young men come and go. A diary, not the book Heart of Darkness, but the diary that Joseph Conrad actually kept going up the Congo. Incidentally, he went up the Congo with Roger Casement, the great Irish nationalist, who we educated in, who we executed in, not educated, <laughs> in 1915. We only gave his body back uh, to Ireland uh, quite recently. And Conrad writes, it's queer how out of touch with truth the women are. They live in a world of their own, and there's never been anything like it 
and never can be. He implied the brutal world of men in empire was increasingly hidden from the gentle world of women. I, I always call charity shops modern museums. Um, and in charity shops, you used to always have a little pile of nice, fine linen and lace and embroidered tablecloths. And they made me start to think of the hours of labour women spent on these pieces of needlework. You know, if you were in polite society, you had a nice napkin for each meal and, uh, and all of that. Um, but I dealt a lot with Germany and worked a lot with German artists. And I'm quite interested in that juxtaposition of the way in which Germany has had to analyse itself because of the Nazi Holocaust in a way that Britain, and I think the States as well, have never had to analyse themselves in the same way. And that's a little bit where I'm kind of coming from at the moment. That Hannah Arendt, which I really recommend to you, her great PhD thesis that she wrote in when she managed as a young Jewish girl to finally escape to America in the early 1940s. It's called The Origins of Totalitarianism. And it was about the hunt for gold in the medieval world. And it's quite interesting, the radio program this morning was repeated again in Radio 4 at 9.30 this evening, uh, where they look at a different historical story. Is actually on the Jewish pogrom here in Norwich in the medieval period. Uh, so learn a bit of local history by listening to that at 9.30 this evening. Um, but Hannah Arendt's PhD thesis, The Origins of Totalitarianism, was about the hunt for gold in the medieval world. Um, and in the first section, uh, and it was dealing well, with alchemy and that idea that you could make them. And then the second section is about Africa, and uh, particularly about the Belgian Congo and the hunt for gold there. And then in the third section, she deals with the Holocaust and, say, uh, and expresses the idea that the Holocaust, the main motivation of it, was the hunt for Jewish gold to continue the German war effort and be able to buy arms internationally. A footnote in the central section says that the Belgian Congo population between 1885 and 1914 declined from between 20 to 30 million down to 8 to 9 million just in that 20 year period. John Davis, I've got the book here, it's just been republished as soon as I can reach. Um, it's just been republished. It's been out of print for 12 or so years, and it was a very small edition to begin with. He's a lecturer at UCLA, and this is his book on late Victorian holocausts around the world. Uh, he takes Hannah Arendt's uh, uh, conclusion in the end of uh, late, uh, the origins of totalitarianism and begins to explore it. And what he says uh, um, uh, he takes Hannah Arendt's footnote. Um, little conclusion at the end of the origins of totalitarianism, where she says it would be very wrong if everyone simply pointed at Germany as the great horrors without dealing with what happened in empires right around the world. Um, and he, he has a particularly savage chapter on the British Empire between 1885 and 1914. 30 million people died in India and 20 million died in China from the deliberate use of famine by the British Army as a way of controlling rebel populations. Uh, it's very interesting to go on the internet at the moment and look up uh, famines in India. And one of the last great famines in India was in 1943 
where Churchill diverted grain boats coming from Australia to relieve the famine in Calcutta and diverted them to the Mediterranean where they weren't absolutely crucial in the same way. And as a result, 1.5 million died in Calcutta. I don't know if the coloration of the two things is deliberate, uh, but that seems a much more um, important critique of the new five pound note than the one about uh, what it's made of. Yeah, Aram goes on to talk about the, the Holocaust that stretched right around the globe with Spanish and Portuguese in Central and South America and parts of Africa, the French in North, West and Southern Africa, the Italians in Abyssinia and the US and the UK against the First Nations and the Australians against the Aborigines. It was this that led me to work recently on Picasso's involvement with modern Africa, which is where we started talking. So let us discuss with Jocelyn, whose experiences of Africa are much greater than mine. I went once, I worked quite a lot with the Jamaican community up in Birmingham, and uh, I did a big exhibition of Annie Burke's photographs of the Jamaican community there, and we took it to the University of Johannesburg. And I was very careful to check before I went that it was uh, a university where they had black students as well as white students. And it was, it was 70% black students. Um, of course, when I started doing it, when I got there, the students who mostly lived in townships you know, uh, around Johannesburg and were just busing in daily to go to, to the university, they had to pay the same kind of extortionate fees that you're having to pay here, which of course meant that they were starting the rest of their lives with enormous debts and they had very little hope of ever paying off. So it wasn't quite as nice a gesture on the part of the white South African society and thought. Um, yeah. Where do we start? I don't know. Do you want to ask them questions? Well, I assume that me sitting here in academic circles in England mm -hmm. and Scotland um, and see things in a way which would have been very different and perhaps less sketchy than I've gone into here if I'd born, been born into the family as you were. And the question is, sorry, just my question is, you know, this sort of very stark statement mm -hmm. that I've deliberately made, yeah. how would you begin to explain a more human aspect of it? Well, there's certain things I certainly agree with. The, 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 taking the, the women, um, uh, the women who do this um, embroidery, well, of course, um, the women in Zimbabwe made masses of, of, of um, embroidered um, tablecloths and things, bed springs. And Are you talking the, the, about the white women or the black women? No, the black women. Um, and they were the ones that made the money in, to, to help their families yeah. um, in many ways. Um, and this is during my time, not so much Stephen's time. Um, they made the money to, to add to the coffers to, to help their families, while the black men were probably out war and fighting during the 15-year war um, between the six um, so, so you know. The, but what I was talking mm. about with the tablecloths and the little bits of embroidery is the way in which, up until the first oh, world war, yeah. most of uh, the peoples from the empire and their were separated from, from their wives for uh, <coughs> eighteen months, two years of duty, and 
the men get six months back in Europe. And so the women who gave with their sons at public school were kind of separated from their husbands for long periods of time. And I see those little pieces of lace that you still find as being kind of symbols of not being able to think about the reality of their circumstances. You know, if you can imagine what it must have been like to not have your husband there for 18 months. Absolutely. Better. And then, could you talk to him honestly? Did you have a girlfriend, darling? Or perhaps you were gay, <laughs> you know, bisexual. Uh, you, you know, sort of you... The, the kind of dishonesty, which I feel is still here, amongst what I call the officer class in Britain, you know, coming as I do from the working class background, I, I find it very difficult uh, wherever I turn in England, uh, you know, whoever runs the Tate or runs the Arts Council, the management of any kind of educational structure, the government, uh, you know, all come from that public school officer class background, which is dependent on this dishonesty of empire. I'm not talking with you speaking from a very different position, yeah, not um, from that officer class position, but a reality of what it was like for people who actually migrated to Africa. Well, I mean, when, when my parents migrated, they migrated as a couple, so they, mm -hmm. that was in the 50s. It wasn't prior, I mean, to that. So that's what I understand. There wasn't that separation. And actually, we, we heard nothing of that in schools and things, um, of, of the pre, the, 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 the missionaries, or etc. who came out without, um, without their partners. Um, so it's a totally different and I haven't to that at all. So I can only speak about what I know. Mm -hmm. um, Which is what I'm interested in. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, my parents went out there after the war. Um, I haven't even looked into yet, which I should do, is why they went out. They've gone now, so I can't ask them particularly. But was there not in Australia? Sorry? Um, like there was in Australia, where there was a special, um, they were they got special passage fares to go out to Australia and and there. I'm not quite sure if this happened. Do you know whether it happened in Zimbabwe? I know that they actively encouraged people to go out. Yeah, but did they? <coughs> whether they sponsored them, I don't know. Yeah, the sponsorships, and this is something that I would need to look into. Um, so I can only do it from that point of view. I do know from the missionary's point of view, yes, a lot of them went out with their wives, um, and Rob's family go that far back. Um, and they, but again, they didn't see their families for mm -hmm. many years. Um, I don't even think my parents saw their families much. Um, I think in my lifetime, um, my mum and dad returned to England probably three or four times while I was growing up. Not even that, maybe twice, um, um, because of the cost. Um, but as far as, um, yeah, I mean, I can only say from a much more modern or, or later perspective what actually mm. happened to me and, and how I became there. But prior to that, I had done a huge amount. My work here is very much about the last 20 years of the Garden Wall. Mm -hmm. um, very much more than, than prior to that. Although in this place, you know, the, the, the weight of tea yeah. it, it brings the colonial aspect into it and what colonialism has, has done in sort of a roundabout way because everything that ties in with Britain and Garby has turned out the way he... Yeah. It's because of his hatred of white people and Britain and, you know, and, yeah. so, so, I mean, I have brought in a little bit of the colonial side of it. Did McGarvey represent...
quite a common feeling amongst the black people. Certainly, I think, in the beginning. Um, you know, the, the whites represented the whites and the blacks represented the blacks. And, yeah, I know he was a very popular candidate in the beginning. Can I ask quickly, when did he come to power? Uh, 80, 1980. Okay. So, three years. Are we there? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, 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 we were there. We were there. Yeah. So you watched all this going on actually in situ? Yeah, but actually, from my point of view, and I can't speak for anyone else, it didn't bother me that the black government came in. It, it, it wasn't, and I don't think it bothered my parents, other than um, the concern of what was going to happen to these farms. But of course, in the Lancaster Agreement, an agreement between Thatcher and the government, it was, um, they did say that they would support a willing buyer, willing seller, um, farm takeovers, um, by helping financially with that. The land wasn't going to be paid for, but the, what even improvements were done would be paid for. So it was on the willing. And for some farmers who I think sold in this right back in the beginning of McGarvey's rule, they came out of it with some. Whereas um, when the Labour government came and Tony Blair played short, they cut off that. They said it's nothing to do with us anymore. And that's where Britain withdrew totally. And that was the end of any financial help. And of course things changed then. I mean, there were other things as well. There was a, the negotiation with the whites. Ian Smith, who was the white president, the president then, uh, during white rule, was kept in the government for, I think, 10 years. Um, there was a 10-year span where the whites' interests were looked after. Yeah. Okay. During that 10-year span, you know, things actually went quite well. And so people sort of relaxed and said, you know, the government's going to be okay. You know, it's Doing okay. But the moment Britain pulled out um, financially, of that financial work, um, things went disastrously wrong. My um, understanding as a historian from what I've been reading mm -hmm. is that after the Second World War, France in particular gave up its colonies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, Ghan the Gold Coast became Ghana. Nigeria reached the credit level of independence, but there was so much financial, high up financial interest, both in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, particularly with mining, mm -hmm. uh, not just gold, but the new gold, which is uranium, which meant that um, those countries, in different ways, stayed with white colonial rule, where most of Africa had achieved some degree of independence, and this was a particular problem. <laughs> so I wouldn't blame the Labour government here, you because know, I wouldn't uh, say it's all of it, but it is part of it. But the reason the Conservative mm -hmm. government and um, Smith mm -hmm. Did something to kind of keep things going was because of mining interests and the big mining, cor mining corporations mm -hmm. uh, in the US and in Britain yeah. wanting to keep that going. Yeah, I would think it goes very much deeper than I've actually yet researched um, because I'm sort of on the periphery of it all. I only started this degree and all this research. What was you it know? like growing up? Did you go to a mixed school? No, no, that? not at all. Not it, at all. It was the white no, school. no, no, it was very different. Um, was it a boarding school? I right? went to boarding school, but not all uh, so not all whites went to boarding school. I went to boarding school because I was brought up on the farm, far from any mm -hmm. schools. Um, so I was at boarding school from the age of six, um, both junior and senior. Um, the, our education system was very different to the black education. They had the Bunty education system. Bunty education system. No, not, it wasn't called that. Really. It wasn't, but it was a similar, it was a lower degree of education. Ours was Cambridge um, thing. We learned nothing about Zimbabwe history at school at all. We learned English history. 
I have no idea what the education system within the African schools were, but no, they're, they're totally different. Um, I played with African children on the farm, which was, you know, fine, but, was, but never did I grow up with African children at school. We never have even mixed with any African children. So, yeah, no, it was, it was even in my time of growing up, it was very really different. And how conscious of the military were you? Um, well, the military comprised of the white people and black people. Yeah, you have the key with Southern Africa. Yeah, I mean, the military, I haven't gone into it in detail again, Rob will probably know more about it than I do because he was in the army. But, um, you know, there was a black white situation, but there were a lot of blacks. Um, fighting in the Zimbabwe, in the Rhodesian army, which was run by white people. And then there were the blacks who, you know, d um, escaped into the countryside, went to Mozambique, and were trained by Russia, uh, well, by um, um, Mugabe and Nkomo's troops. And they collected in the various places outside in Mozambique, mostly in Zambia. There was also a whole set of um, issues which I remember when I was playing mm -hmm. around the Kenyan Asians. Uh, um, yes. Do you know much about that? Not an awful lot. I do remember. I mean, it was when I was... I don't know where, what, what years it was. But yeah, they were seen from, I, I think, Uganda to England because of the problems there. And it's all about dictatorship and, you know, mm -hmm. not liking people really. Races not liking other races. And what, the, the, what the perception, well, it's not a perception, it's reality. What, what some races have more than others. And of course, you know, the whites in Zimbabwe had lovely big houses and big farms and, you know, which wasn't the same as what black people had. The time I was so, it was we, definitely segregation without a doubt. But can I shut up a and ask if anyone wants to ask Jessie the same question? Mm -hmm. Well, so regarding regarding my 1980 ish. And you said the first ten years were right. The first ten years was, you know, the education system was yeah. integrated, yeah. and you yeah. know. And then the, the British removed their financial support. And you said after that. Well, that was yeah. one of the reasons. They for the, the, this was for the farms for for British yes. and farms. Well, yeah. What do you think the other reasons were? You say. Well, I suppose it's exactly as Linda has said. Well, the other reasons. Well, I suppose. I don't know, we didn't have oil, uh, oil I suppose, and that we didn't have much of what they really wanted. Or they focused the, the, everything on the yeah, Middle well, East. I, I understand, though not sympathised with the reasons why the British withdrew their financial support. But how quickly did the situation deteriorate after I that? I think they affected them. Stephen, maybe you can answer a bit on that one. Um, from where I grew up, there weren't that many white people left in Zimbabwe, and um, there was kind of a, like the inflation had gone down. But I think this was due to Zimbabwe um, kicking out all the white people that had the expertise in the yes. world, because they learned how to probably in school and from how to learn the best product. So I don't really agree that we probably should have put people out. I think they should have been. Um, Collaboration between the two people so that the country is run properly, so that um, everyone has the same problems, but you know, kind of everyone is all the same as well, like the one that is the master state. I think I think a lot of like, the whites left by choice too, and that also was the pers that was the feeling that whites didn't want to live under it. Yeah. So, you know, there was two sides to yeah. that. Um, and of course, you know, Mugabe's anger at the whites didn't help us either. Exactly. It didn't help. But yes, there was far too little collaboration, far too little talk. Um, 
the ones stood for what they wanted, i.e. pre, um, pre-Mugabe life, and the blacks wanted what they... So, so yeah, no, there was there's a lot of aggravation there. Mm. And, um, you know, the thing with the whites, of course, you know, we, we came from places like Britain, mostly. Yeah. We were able to come back here because Britain accepted us. Yeah. For the black people who struggled through all this, they had nowhere else to go. And they are the people I feel so much more sorry for that, you know, because we could yes, get on a plane, start again, but we could get on a plane. And leave. Yeah, I've done a lot of work on emigrants. Mm. Um, I particularly worked at the period from uh, 33 to 53, the wartime period of the emigrants who came to this country. And I got particularly interested in a group of art historians who came from Hungary, mm. uh, from Budapest, and they'd be they'd seen that the, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you know, which goes quite back in this week, but it kind of came to an end at the end of the First World War. And they'd then gone on to Vienna and studied Italian painting in Vienna. Uh, and the really interesting one of them, Frederick Anta, he works on uh, uh, Giotto, and was particularly interested in asking the question of what happened between 1300 and 1440, uh, that you had the end of Giotto and that wonderful sense of reality, which is like looking at the faces surrounding you every day, uh, and the way in which Italian painting then goes back to gold skies and kind of turning into figures. And he wondered why this had happened, and he starts to find it. And it was only with the Medici later on to kind of take off. Uh, and it seems that it was the Florentine Republic over those years took against uh, the Franciscan movement because it was too radical. Mm. Uh, and it was politically radical. And the way in which the Florentine Republic was surviving, what it became famous for, was in fact. Uh, supplying everything that was needed for the Crusades. France was the sort of centre of uh, the money dealing and, and you know, getting together of everything that the Crusaders needed. And it seems a really famous thing about France is because I'm not religious, so I didn't know about that. But the really famous thing about Francis of Assisi is that he went to Bethlehem with just a small group of six or eight monks uh, in the midst of the First Crusade, and the fighting was all taking place. Um, he, he was uh, uh, patronized by the Sultan of Egypt, and there's a famous story about walking on fire and things like that. Uh, but it was considered very dangerous, and they didn't want the Franciscan movement and that abandonment of poverty to be what uh, people were looking to. And uh, Antal talks about this 140 years as a period of decline. And I take this term, a period of decline, and I feel that Antal was very much writing about what he felt when he came to England in 1933. He, he came to England, but he went first of all to Moscow for a year, and he said he couldn't possibly live in Russia because it was like going into a feudal society. You know, there was the aristocracy with all their paintings and everything, but the mass of people were still living in a feudal system. But it was only after the Second World War he wrote a great article in the Burlington magazine uh, about what he saw as being the problem with Britain. And the problem with Britain is that we've only had one revolution, and that was in 1640. We haven't had any social revolution since 1640. And he was using this um, a little bit. He uses the few of the sentences in this article, deals with the way in which Britain might have used empire as a way of gathering money that stopped the need for any of the social revolutions 
that other parts of Europe were having, you know, every hundred or two hundred years. Um, and we'd managed to stave it off by using empire as a way of keeping order in, in the society, um, which I, I find just very profound. Isn't in the, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really classy at history, but um, something struck me is in about 1850, a huge number of churches were built because there was worries about insurgents and stuff. Yeah, so you had the Peter Moon massacre. Yeah, presumably that was just money that was kind of especially coming from Empire. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's really fun. Well, of course, the problem. Yeah, like the slave trips. Yeah. 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 What I was interested in in this discussion was not a criticism of no. white people in southern Rhodesia or, or, or in Africa, because I see them as honourable you know, desire to, to kind of go out. But it's the problems in this country that we're all still suffering from, which is my major concern. Uh, you know, the ways of thinking, the ways of thinking, the way in which we're not dealing with them. Uh, and, you know, I think Britain's had a huge influence on the states, and the states now has a huge influence on Britain. So when a lot of, you know, not particularly well off people sent over, you know, to colonize, you know, to do a job for colonizing, basically, it wasn't, it wasn't the other classes who actually went and did all the, the jobs that they were doing.
don't think so. I think it's um, we need some good artists doing work about it. <laughs> no, but yeah, but narrow down to your own experience. Yeah, yeah, to 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 experiences that I can cope with at the moment. I mean, you know, thirty years down the line, I might not be here, but thirty years down the line, um, maybe the bigger. Can I just be ask? Uh, you about your family and where they came to England. When? I mean, no. Sorry. You're Korean. So, so it's not. It's touched by the. Um, I don't know the French, Japanese. No, it's. Um, French Indochina is Vietnam, isn't it?
Where's mine when you went out in 50 after the war? 51. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much.